You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Ryan, hi. Hey. How are you? That was very uh, Yiddish of you. <sighs> How are you? Uh, I hope you guys had a glorious weekend. Uh, our music video uh, came out. Sunspin. I directed my first music video, a uh, little low budget music video called Summertime Neighbor, one of the tracks on the new album, which you can get on iTunes and um, Amazon on your computer, not your phone. Just go on your computer and download it. This is a CD. See that? But anyway, Summertime Neighbor, uh, the music video came out and people are digging it. Uh, I'm glad. It was a fun half a day, maybe three fourths of a day work. And it was nice to be out there and, you know, just kind of guiding the ship and enjoying it. So that was, uh, that was fun. Uh, what else? I watched this uh, documentary on Billie Holiday and yeah. um, poof, it was, it was, it was a little heavy. Yeah. But you know, I mean, she lived, she died at 44 years old. Yeah. Young man, and she, what a voice! And she just went through a lot in her life. And uh, you know, I remember I don't know if I'm quoting her exactly, but she was talking about death, and she said, "I think we're all trying to put a hundred days into one." Huh. And it was something like that, which really rang true for me because I think we're trying to do instead of just living here right now in the moment, enjoying it, we're doing a hundred things. We're we're ahead of ourselves. We're not really enjoying this moment. Like mm. I'm not really enjoying my time with you right now because me neither. <laughs> I'm kidding. What a fucking drag. What a drag, man. <laughs> this fucking sucks. But you know, it was, it was kind of interesting. It was like she said something like, "Try, we're trying to fit a hundred days into one," and it's just like, just relax, you know. And uh, I could be misquoting her, but it was something along those lines, and it just resonated with me. And uh, I think that's the thing. We're always thinking ahead so much. We're always thinking about what we could do and how we could. Do. And sometimes, man, I don't know how many times you hear about when people on their deathbed, they ask them and they're just like, I wish I just would have been more present. I wish I would have just yeah. not worked so much. I wish I would have. Mm -hmm. And if you're hearing it from so many people, I mean, this isn't just like one or two people, but they've done studies. Then why don't we just everybody just stop fucking working? Everybody just stop what you're doing right now. Go hug something. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, we can't do that now right no don't don't <laughs> hug anybody that's not what i meant it was uh well, it's hug something. proverbial hug <laughs> you mean what you mean what you said hug something just yeah hug, an your, object. hug your dog hug a tree hug a door hug a door hug a it's all a goddamn i don't know why i want to say hug a dick <laughs> no that's on a person and that could have covid on it covid could it could have covid dick i don't sorry for getting crass this early in the morning i, I normally don't you know that so forgive me um thank you for listening to the podcast last week was a lot of fun last week was um zach levi mm -hmm. and uh did very well and i appreciate everybody listening and he really opened up more than he usually does and he opens up a lot normally so thank you zach levi please go listen to it if you haven't the michael cudlitz from walking dead's great katie cassidy from uh arrow um hers is really touching and she talks about her dad david cassidy and uh so it's important that you guys uh, write a review. And if you're enjoying the podcast, it truly helps the podcast. So Ryan, just give them those. Uh... Uh, at Inside of You Pod on Twitter, at Inside of You Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. So just uh, follow us and on Apple Podcast or wherever, mm -hmm. please write a review and tell me you're digging the show. And that, that bumps us up in the ratings, if that means anything to some people, which it might mean something to my boss over at Westwood One. They might say, oh, look, you jumped to a 98. Oh. <laughs> isn't that special isn't that special uh if you want to get any cool merch like uh signed cds of the band go to sunspin.com we've got hats lunch boxes and if you want anything related to uh you know smallville lex luther all that stuff we got lex luther t-shirts smallville lunch boxes that's on the inside of you online store so you can get that i think there's a discount code going on right now uh in no there's a sunspin code right now the sunspin code mm. on the sunspin.com for merch is sunspin 10 i don't know this shit i don't even know try it <laughs> <laughs> try it see if that shit works i want to say thanks to uh thanks ryan for for working so hard and, and bryce for uh giving us a good podcast here you guys are really you know you put it together and it's 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 nice to I don't know. It's nice to be do something that you're proud of, and it's quality. I think we, we're giving people quality. The sound, sound, you know, it sounds good. It looks good on the YouTube when you edit it. Uh, yeah, the equipment's great. The equipment's great. We have a <laughs> nice room here. Uh, you know, you could write into us at hello at insideofupodcast dot com. 
thanks to all my patrons out there who support the podcast. If you want to join Patreon, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful family. I'll text you right after you join. It's Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com slash inside of you or inside. Patreon.com slash inside of you. Try inside of you or inside. Anyway, um, I think that's it. Why don't we get into our guest? You know, this this guest is, you know him from MTV and Jackass and like all these movies, but he's really started his own little empire. I gotta give it to him. I mean, this guy's been through some hell and he keeps fighting and keeps coming through. And uh, you know. He talks, he's pretty open about, you know, we talked about, I believe, unless you cut it, Ryan, about <laughs> loving thyself and, you know, you, you like yourself. You, th- these questions seem kind of trivial. I'm like, well, what does it really mean? I hate when people ask me that. It, it's a legit question. I mean, Ryan, if I said, do you like yourself? You're, you're probably going to say, eh, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. You, but you, you love yourself? I, I do. Okay. To see, that's a pretty quick, solid answer. I honestly can't answer those questions as easily but i'm working on that so when i ask people sometimes and i don't do it i don't do it to interrogate but uh, i think sometimes you know i think that answer is deep down deep inside you and mm-hmm. it's like it, it it takes i don't know what the fuck i'm saying it just it takes time to really be honest with yourself because you could say yeah i fucking love myself man i like i'm awesome well, i'm fucking <laughs> great but uh, I think it stems from childhood. I really do think it, there's a certain thing where, you know, something happens along the way and I'm not blaming. But, you know, then you're like, Fuck, why don't I love myself? That's weird. I think I'm a good guy for the most part, but nah, I'm irritable. I could be a little bitch, you know, and then you start doubting yourself. And that's what so you got to really stop that. Stop being so hard on yourself. So that's what I'm learning that, hey, you know, you, we all fuck up every day. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. You make mistakes. You, you know, you 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 dump your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. If you cheat on them, maybe you're. Does it mean you're bad? No, it probably means that you did a bad thing, and you're bad in that moment. But does that mean you're bad for the rest of your life? You're terrible. I'm not insinuating that I I'm <laughs> cheating. I or I have a girlfriend to cheat on, <laughs> for that matter. I'm just saying in general. Let's get into Stevo. It's my point of view. Listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> What's up, dude? I'm just kicking it, man. What a great bed. Are you in an RV, man? I sure am. This is my traveling podcast studio tattoo shop movie trailer uh surf mobile you have a tattoo shop in your trailer we had uh, <laughs> it's 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 a, a class b motorhome built on a dodge ram chassis oh. it's a uh, a little bit smaller than your average tattoo shop but we get it done do you know how to tattoo people or you have someone who tattoos no, no, I do, man. I, I'm actually uh, an apprentice at this time. Um, but it seems that tattoos from Stevo are in rather high demand. <laughs> are, are they are they quality? They are surprisingly good for a tattoo from Stevo. I've got a tattoo portfolio <laughs> that uh, that I, I'm just so uh, serious about, man. You know. I, I, put, I really put effort into it, and it, it came about, uh, I never thought about it, you know, like the, the first tattoo I ever did was, I think, uh, 2006, and and someone just uh, produced a tattoo machine while I was on stage performing in front of a crowd. I wanted to be quick about it. I never wiped away the ink. I was just tattooing in this big mess of black ink. And then and I was tattooing my name. When, when I finished and wiped away the ink, uh, I had misspelled my own name. It said <laughs> Stevo. And, uh, and it was just an awful experience overall. And, um, and, and over the years, you know, when presented with a tattoo machine, I'd be like, yeah, sure. 
But then a year and a half ago, I decided, what if I really tried? What if I took on, you know, somewhat ambitious designs and did my absolute best? And I was surprised by the results. So now uh, I got a whole apprenticeship. Um, I'm, uh, I, I believe I've just sold a television show called Steve-O's Bad News Tattoos. <laughs> you believe you sold the show. You're not sure yet? Uh, well, I, like we've sold the, uh, uh, it's not a pilot. I think they don't make pilots anymore as much um, because it, because when the pilot's shot, they can't they, they they can't really air it because it sticks out like a sore thumb as not part of the series. Right. So they sort of scale it back, and I understand that we've been granted seventy five thousand dollars to make a proper presentation of what the show would look like. Right now, art, now see, I, I I think about things like art, and that's one thing I run from. Like I, I I'm not a good artist. I can barely make a three D L. Or, you know, how you do, you know, how you make it look 3D. And I, like, I, I couldn't even imagine that. So were you like, did you, were you always drawing and drawing cool shit and designs? I, I think it's a misconception that tattooing is, is uh, a function of drawing. It's really much more a function of tracing. You know, you'll, you'll trace on the carbon paper for what's called the stencil. And then you'll trace over that with the needle. I mean, sure. When you get into shading and stuff, there's, a, there's a level of, of, uh, art to it but you don't have to actually draw the uh the thing you trace it but i'm colorblind too <laughs> good <laughs> so, so <laughs> uh yeah i mean hey maybe it's not for you and, and, and it, 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 it's, it's a lot of work man there's there's no question about it but um the, there's a level of satisfaction that comes with with being surprised by uh the fact that you did a better job than you thought you could well, that's, kudos, that's man. Into it. Well, kudos. You know, I look at your life and your, all this shit, and everybody knows you and you're world famous. You got two, you know, you have five million people on YouTube watching your channel, and you do these kind of sit down, talk about your life and moments and in, in, intercut videos. And it's really cool. I just watched the surfing one about how you had his wrong name, and everybody was fucking up the dude's name that surfed this giant wave. Uh, but, right. But right, you, 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 yeah, you posted it, and uh, unfortunately, you were called the asshole. Twenty-two million people, I guess, tweeted the wrong person. You, you fucked his name up, so they gave. Well, well, right, yeah. I, I saw a clip that that a buddy of mine had posted. It was this guy surfing like an eighty-foot wave, and they, they, there was, uh, you know, they were saying it was the biggest wave ever ridden. And I thought, right on, you know. And I posted it too, uh, giving credit to what turned out to be the wrong surfer. <laughs> And, uh, you know, a bunch of people had posted this clip crediting the wrong surfer, but I was the guy whose, whose post got 22 million views. Jesus. So, so that was the headline. Steve-O posts big wave surf, you know, wrong surfer. Were you? Wrong guy. <laughs> uh, what's your dog's name there? Oh, uh, this is Wendy. Wendy. I yeah, I found her in the streets of Peru. You really look like a hoe, Wendy. You gotta, yeah, your legs propped get, up there. Get, 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 get your act together. <laughs> yeah, um, this dog is a bit of a celebrity in her own right. I found her in the streets of Peru. And um, this is bittersweet, but the video that I made and posted of finding this dog in the streets of Peru is the most viewed piece of content that I've ever posted online. It got over a hundred million views, the wow. video of me finding this dog. And uh, as wonderful as, as it is, the, it's heartwarming and, and, and this dog is my companion. But for fuck's sake, the lengths I've gone to to try to get attention. And, 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 and it's a, the finding the dog video that was a hit. Unfortunately, it was the wrong dog. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it stings that that was the the most attention I ever got. But what, what can you do? Well, I think that's kind of cool. Think about it, man. It's like something. It's like affectionate. It's empathetic. Yeah. It's like it's it's like what people really like. So it's like a side of you maybe that they weren't used to or accustomed yeah, I mean, to. True. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. So, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I mean, I've been through, you know, walked through entire days with this dog and, and every single person that, uh, that stopped for a photo knew her by name. It was, it's crazy, man. That's all. You know, I look at all this shit, man. And, 
you know, I look at your life and I'm like, here's a guy, your dad was corporate, right? He was kind of a corporate guy. And you, you go, you go to clown school. You went to Barnum and Bailey for like circus school, which I mean, were you doing shit at a young age? Your dad's in a suit and tie and you're like jumping off cliffs and you know, I mean, a little bit. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I heard a story about, uh, me as a toddler you know, not even walking, I don't think. And they said there was like climbing out of a window on some like 15th story, you know, <laughs> apartment or something. Um, yeah, I was definitely acting like an asshole from uh, a very early age. And and my overdeveloped need for attention was uh, prominent, you know, out of the gate. So I've always been an attention whore. And, um, you know, at, at, at whatever age, there was always just something that, uh, that I was acting out with. Did you feel like it was, uh, cause you know, with me, I, I, I can relate. I always wanted to make my father laugh. I always wanted him to like, accept me. I always wanted, and my dad was very corporate work, you know, six to five or six every night. And, you know, I think I was sort of like my mom in a way where I was kind of all over the place, uh, short attention span, didn't know what the hell I was doing. Wasn't good in school, started, you know, acting and things like that. And just, I think he just kind of looked at me like, nah, eh, fuck this son. I guess the next son's going to be better. And, you know, my brother, brother was smarter and they got along better. In fact, my mom once was, she, I remember saying, Oh, Mark to my dad, I know Eric's your favorite. We all know Eric's your favorite in front of me. And I'm like, Jesus <laughs> Christ. I mean, I knew it, but to hear my mother say it, so what I'm saying is I always was like, I couldn't, it wasn't enough. And I felt like I was always trying to get attention from other people, from whatever to, to because I didn't get that attention with my dad. Do you think, think that there was part of that? Is Eric an older brother? Eric is my younger brother. He's, he's the okay. smarter one. Yeah. He's uh he's like six years younger. So I think that to me is an indication that, that neither of your parents are alcoholic. Is that right? That's actually, you know, my mom was sort of a pill popper a little bit. My dad really never uh -huh. drank, but he was extremely strict, you know, even though he did a bunch of shit, which I didn't know. I mean, if you, like, you would have been in prison. Like, my, my dad, if it, it was you, because he, I, I remember got my ear pierced by the next door neighbor, and I looked at him <laughs> with my opposite ear, and I go, hey, what would you think if I ever got my ear pierced? He goes, you'd go to a halfway house is what you do. I go, oh, see, well, uh, I'm going to be at Nate's next door for the next week till this heals. You know what I mean? So, like, sure. so was your father like that? Was he strict? Was he, did you feel like you needed to act out or? Well, yeah. I mean, it, my whole family dynamic is, is, uh, it really explains everything. Um, I, to, you know, take it, uh, you know, the sort of one piece at a time. Yes, my dad was strict and he was a, a, a corporate executive, but his job, um, involved a great deal of travel. So he was almost not there more than he was there. And so it was a, a very inconsistent, like if dad was around, he would try to kind of uh, compensate for the time he was gone by being more of a disciplinarian, I, I think, you know? And so it was just like, dad's not here. I can do whatever. Dad's here. Oh, you know, it's sort of, sort of an inconsistent thing. And um, as far as uh, the family dynamic goes, my dad uh, was actually sort of the black sheep of his family for choosing a career in business. Um, he came from uh, just a long line of academics, scholars, theologians, clergymen, zoologists. You know, like he was, uh, just, it was just a very, very, like incredibly academic and, and lower earning uh, lineage that my dad came from, you know, he, he grew up with, with, with very little money, but just a lot of prestige, you know, all this, uh, scholastic kind of, kind of a thing. And then, and, uh, you know, his dad was a published author and a zoologist and, and a decorated, uh, you know, army colonel, um, all this very, very respected family. And then dad's going to go into business. And that was like, all right, well, that's not what I would have chosen for you, son, you know? <laughs> Right. Um, and then on my mom's side of the family, it's all alcoholism, you know, gambling, suicide, like addiction, like just really, really dark, uh, you know, addiction stuff. And, um, 
the way that that works, I, I have an older sister. I'm the second of two children. And um, it's sort of a cookie cutter kind of a deal that when you have uh, an, an, an absentee alcoholic parent, that the first child will will really overachieve, you know, it's, just, it's like, wow, I'm not being noticed, you know, like I've got, like my parents have other stuff going on, they're not paying attention to me, so to try to get noticed, I, I'm going to overachieve, I'm going to get straight A's, I'm going to look at me, I'm perfect, you know, is that enough for you? And, uh, and I think that that's, that that's a pretty regular sort of stereotype that, that, that really applies to my situation where I have this overachieving older sister and then I come into the picture. You know, there's not a lot of attention being doled out by either parents because dad's gone and mom's drunk. And my sister is this perfect straight A character doing everything right. And, you know, the second child comes along and looks at the efforts of the older child and says, wow, there is no fucking way I can compete with that. <laughs> right. You know, like I'm not even going to try to compete with the straight A's and and, and do everything. So I'm just going to try to get through like, you know, based on, uh, you know, you know, just being a class clown, kind of like go for laughs, you know, like that, you know, and uh, not even try to, to achieve anything. Um, but at the end of the day, what my dad's family brings to the table is this like intense drive for whatever it's for. And so like, I'm a hybrid of my dad's, this, my dad's side's sort of tenacity and, and perseverance coupled with my mom's side's, uh, what do you call it? Uh, deviance, you know, deviance and, and uh, dysfunction. And so I'm like just this hyper, perseverant fucking you know like deviant with uh you know a, a really overdeveloped need for attention and I, I think that when you look at it that way it makes sense how it turned out the way i did yeah i, I read something where it was like it was years later because you know you know your mom was sick she had an aneurysm or something and and your your, yeah. your dad was you guys were talking outside and this was like 2000 uh -huh. Three and he and he was it, 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 that that was actually in 1998. My mom died in 2003, um, and and she died after having survived a brain aneurysm five years prior. And it was just sort of like one of these things where, you know, I understood that she like cooked some three course meal, you know, like normal, normal, and then like the next morning. I kind of got up and, and, and whatever happened, like she had just had a, a blood vessel in her brain just pop and there was no way to see it coming or anything. And, uh, it was just a, a super, you know, get her to the hot, you know, and, and, and most people don't survive these, uh, the subarachnoid brain hemorrhages, um, you know, and, and mom did survive it, but, had, but, but was left really, uh, physically and mentally disabled and um and whatever in the you know she had brain surgery all this and and the family Jesus. came from all dad i think had flew over from england and and my sister and i were in albuquerque new mexico we all met in florida and it was just this kind of crisis management situation and um and we left at the hospital just for a meal and it was it was uh at this 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 restaurant and you know there's crazy circumstances where mom's you know got this brain thing and uh and dad chose that time to say hey son i feel i feel i've done a disservice to you um by not supporting you in this career path that that you've clearly committed yourself to and he said you know my my dad i didn't choose what my dad wanted and he had a similar conversation with him you know he had son you, you didn't you know you're not doing what i would have chosen for you but given that you're committed to it I, I uh, you know, I just want you to be the best at it. You know, I, I pledge to support you, and, and it put a lot of wind in my sails. Did you? Were you emotional? Um, I mean, it it, it, was, it was a heavy, heavy uh, situation. I mean, that was like the least of what was going on at the time. Yeah, it, it meant a lot. You know, um, it was almost like all right. You know, I I almost didn't think that that would really change a whole lot. Uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of a loser. At that point, I had not made any money. I had not uh, really accomplished anything. I'd, I'd had, uh, you know, photos in a couple of skateboard magazines, and the photos were not of me skateboarding. You know, like I just did not have my act together, and uh, 
so, so it's a big credit to my dad that he, you know, didn't jump on the bandwagon after I had some success, you know, like I, I, I really love to say that I don't feel uh, that having a great relationship with my father is because I'm successful, but rather I think that, you know, I've been able to achieve some success because I have a great relationship with my father. And, and that's a, a really, dis- a really major distinction that, that, uh, that does make me feel emotional. You know, that's, my dad's yeah. support's been a big deal. Inside of You is brought to you by Better Help. This is, uh, these guys are one of my favorites. We talk about this. Obviously, if you're listening to the podcast right now, a lot of guests, we talk about adversity. We talk about anxiety, getting through life, and we all have a tough time sometimes. Ryan, I know you have a tough time. I know I have a tough time. Uh-huh. And it's important to talk about it. You know, a lot of people ask me, you know, what is therapy? And, and really, therapy is whatever you want it to be. Therapy could be dealing with um, depression and talking about your depression and why you're sad a lot of the times, or if you have anger issues or you want to just get something off your mind. It could really be anything. Just talking to someone, confiding in someone that you can trust. I mean, these are therapists. Everything you say or tell them is confidential. So, um, I think that's really important and we all need someone to talk to besides just our buddy who has no real insight and no education into what we really need. (laughs) Um, It's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. Start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, I could tell you that, because especially in Hollywood, therapy is skyrocketed. I mean, one hour with someone is is just astronomical, and um, it's incredibly affordable at BetterHelp. And you can have a therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really about. It may or may not be for you, but it's worth looking into because you are the greatest asset. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and inside of you listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash inside. That's betterhelp.com slash inside. Inside of You is brought to you by True Underdog Podcast. Raised in a trailer park with no clear path to success, kicked out of high school multiple times, faced with becoming a father in his teens, Jason Waller is the definition of a true underdog. After hearing the words no or you can't too many times, he unleashed the power within to start three successful companies with his most recent venture, Power Home Solar, skyrocketing on a path to becoming a billion-dollar enterprise. Join us as Waller, a four-time Entrepreneur of the Year winner, shares motivational tips and inspiring stories and business building lessons from the ground up. He shares his life experiences and that of his high profile guests to help others better themselves. As Waller will tell you, there's no elevator to success. That climb only happens one step at a time. Let every true underdog podcast be that step that elevates you. Scared money won't make money. Learn about failure. Learn about entrepreneurship. Learn about never quitting or making excuses. It's real, it's raw, it's motivational. Check out True Underdog Podcast at trueunderdog.com or anywhere you get your podcasts. That's profound, man, because, yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I've never really heard that. I think it, it, there's certain, people are built a certain way. Like, you're built a certain way. You're an entertainer. You like to do crazy things, and you just go with your gut, and you, you know, you explore. And, and then there's some people who are like, this is what I know, and they don't understand that other side that side of you or whatever and to appreciate it to respect it to be able to look at someone and go hey he's not like me you know i don't think i've had that like you know i think my dad does the best he can with with me with the way he feels like it's it's just like hey the nurses need some pictures at the hospital for your sister you know and i'm like okay i'll sign them it's not hey i just want you to know if if you suck if you fail, I love you. I, that's, that doesn't exist. That's never existed in my life. I've never heard it. I've never. Right. So I was kind of curious. And so, and I, I didn't know that like he approached you like this before you had the success. So again, when you said yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's sure. a profound, what did that do for you? Did that kind of open? Oh, the- dude, it, 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 
I just said, I'm sorry, I jumped in because I'm no. so excited to answer the question. Um, it, it put fucking wind in my sails, man. Like that, that, um, that the year was 1998. And I think that, uh, you know, at the time, there were, the, at the time, the video camera was really not uh, like a household item. You know, not in the, the, like every household didn't have a video camera, let alone everybody having a video camera in their pocket. You know, there was about enough home video cameras to sustain uh, America's funniest home videos. And at that time, I think that the, uh, you know, at that time, there was another show that had come up called Real TV and uh, Real TV was you know, uh, well, America's Funniest Home Videos was, was family friendly and kind of really funny and like, you know, this this is light and fun. Like, real TV was more like gnarly stuff caught on tape, you know? Like, it was a little bit darker, a little bit, you know? And um, it was after that conversation with my dad that I saw a commercial on TV for real TV. And, and it was this pitch, you know, it says, hey, if you, if you have... Uh oh! Hang on a second, I lost Sorry. you. That's all right. Yeah, I had a, I, I had another call come in. That's all right. Um, so I saw this commercial and it said, "If you have a video that you think we should see, then send it on in to Real TV." And I was like, "Oh well, fuck," you know. Like I had tons of video, <laughs> so I had all these videos. That I sent them in, you know, and it was like I, I called the numbers. I said, "I." I uh, I don't have footage that you might want to see. I have footage that you need badly. You know, I'm just going to put it like that. Like I'm sitting on some gold. And, um, and so they got back to me and they gave me the information to mail it in because, you know, watching footage on the internet wasn't even a thing. I, I sent in the footage and they got back to me and they said, we really like the clip of you uh, on top of the three-story building, setting yourself on fire and doing the fire breathing flip off the roof into the pool. And I was like, is that all out of everything I fucking sent you? That's all that you guys want? They were like, yeah, we just want that clip. We want you jumping without the fire. Then we want to show you jumping with the fire. And they said, we want to give you $500 for exclusive rights to these clips. And I was like, well, what does that mean? I'd never heard of such a thing. And they were like, well, then that means that we own it. And, you know, we own it exclusively. We only own our owners of it. So I'm like, so I can't even like show people that like basically no, <laughs> you know, I'm like, fuck, you know, I want to be on TV. You know, I'd never been on TV, but like, I don't want to give away my rights. And so in a panic, I called it my dad, like dad, 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 they're exclusive. You know, and my dad, just trademark dad. He said, he said, son, or whatever. He said, look, Steve, like calm down, take a breath. Okay. This is really simple. He says, you, 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 you got to just figure out at which point it's a deal breaker for you. You draw a line in the sand and, and you just stick to it. He says, it sounds to me like it's a deal breaker, this exclusivity clause. So why don't you call them back and say, uh, I'm not okay with uh, giving away exclusive rights. You can have non-exclusive rights and you got to give me a thousand dollars for that. And, uh, and that's what I did. <laughs> and that's, and they were, they had no problem with it. Okay, cool. Not exclusive. You get a thousand bucks. And, uh, and that was like my first, um, my first deal, you know, first step um, in negotiation. This is my first, and it's more negotiating than I ever did for Jackass. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know how, but like, given that I had this, you know, high power business father in my corner, you know, it, it seems to follow that I could, should have done much better with all the Jackass <laughs> deals over the years. But, uh, but I, I suppose I'm also glad that I didn't, um, Die push too hard on that. <laughs> didn't didn't die and, and didn't push too hard to where like it would have soured the relationship, you know, because everything worked out well in the end. Right. So from there, it's sort of like you know that video where when you saw it on TV, you're like, oh fuck, was it just like that feeling of like, look at this? It was much more anticlimactic because I thought that being on TV was going to really change something or other, you know, like, and it was just. That fucking thing came and went. Not one person ever mentioned that they saw it. There was, you know, there's a very different experience having that one clip come out on real TV compared to when uh, when I had my first like real bit on Jackass, which was 
the, the, the swallowing the goldfish and barfing it up into a fishbowl. Right. Um, that one, I, I had one thing on the first episode of Jackass, but you could barely recognize me and it wasn't like a really notable bit. It was the second episode of Jackass where I had the, the goldfish trick and um, I did, dude, it's, it, the, the, there was an audience for Jackass right away. And, 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 and like the next day, like, like 24 hours, like within 24 hours of that goldfish bit playing for the first time, I noticed that my life was different, you know, like, like I, I could, like I heard about it like all over the place and, um, and it was, and it was crazy. And, um, I think that, uh, when it was maybe, maybe one week after that, uh, I got a call, um, from the executive producer guy and he said, uh, you know, he said, uh, all right, here's the deal. The show's a hit, you know, now, like we had done eight episodes for the first season, you know, for the entire first season, I was paid less than 1500 bucks after taxes, as I recall. Each episode. And, uh, no, I got paid per bit. I didn't get paid per episode. I got paid per bit. It was 500 bucks for a bit. If it was, uh, like dangerous and, and, and risky. And if it was just like a little gag or, or, you know, a prank that wasn't like uh high impact, then it was 200 bucks. So it's like a stunt man, literally like a stunt man. The more dangerous it is, the more money you make, but they're not paying you that much money. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Like a medical study when I had the government test drugs on me, the more dangerous <laughs> study, the more money you get. <laughs> you right, know? right, right. Uh, but yeah, so, so I got paid um, per bit and all of the bits put together, you know, it was like 1500 bucks. Uh, about after taxes and um and 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 so i got this call like three episodes in and they said all right we like uh, the show's a hit it's the highest ratings that mtv's ever had for like a half hour format kind of a thing and so we know we got to pay you and mtv's ordering 16 episodes you know like there's eight episodes per season they're ordering seasons two and three in one go 16 episodes and we know we got to pay you so we're going to give you two thousand bucks per episode and i and i remember thinking uh 16 times two thousand that's thirty two thousand dollars i'm fucking rich <laughs> 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 like i mean i was just like so, so from it, you know like i just didn't, didn't didn't ever even you know and i don't know man like I think that like as I grew up and, and the house got bigger because dad was increasingly successful, you know, like I was really self-conscious about um, my privileged upbringing, you know, like the big house. I was embarrassed to have kids from school like come over and see that I lived in this big house, you know, like um, I was I was kind of ashamed of my parents' wealth. And, um, you know, and, and as a result, I was just never... I never really found myself, uh, you know, motivated by wealth, like, you know, and, and I just didn't, I just needed very little to get by. And so he had 32,000 bucks, like, holy shit, man, I'm rich. Like, and you didn't negotiate. You didn't negotiate. That I, was I, I, I didn't negotiate at all. No, not, not whatsoever. And, um, I remember we started filming. Um, I, I got paid half, uh, towards the beginning. And um, thirty-two thousand dollars after taxes came to like twenty thousand dollars, and I got half of that, so I received a check for ten thousand dollars. And um, when I found out that I was going to receive a check for ten thousand dollars, I called up the the director Jeff Tremaine, and I said, "Yo, dude, I'm about to get a check for ten thousand dollars, and that shit isn't even gonna be cleared. I'm gonna put it in the bank, and before it even clears into the account." I am going to be fucking in my car driving out to California. I was in Florida at the time and uh, I'm going to drive fucking, you know, I'm going to put it, I'm fucking driving out to LA. I'm moving out to LA to fucking ride this wave. And, and, uh, and Jeff Tremaine said that uh, he said, you're not going anywhere until you send me a list of ideas to film in every state between Florida and California and if the list is on point, then I'll fly out uh, a production team to follow you across country and get all this footage on the road. So, uh, so that's what we did, and uh, it put me way ahead of uh, of the game for shooting for for those you know for that third season, I suppose. 
Um, and yeah, that, that was the deal, man. I moved out there and I got out to California and everyone was like, dude, you know, you better strike while the iron's hot, man. You know, you're, you're fucking, the show's going to be canceled. You're going to, it's going to, this moment's going to pass. And I found that frustrating because I was just trying to like be in the moment. You yeah. Know? And, and, and that's like kind of, everybody was a little bit right. You know, I mean, they are right. Like I, I, up to that point, I viewed all of my video footage like in sort of like a dark, like religious kind of a way that like, fuck, we're, we're all going to be dead, but I want to live forever. And when I videotape something, that fucking video can play after I'm dead. So I won't be dead at all. Like I'm going to fucking live forever. And I had this like, this super like, just like sacred view of like the immortality of video footage you know footage is forever like oh you know right like, it was, there's this huge importance to what i was doing but then when i got out to california and everyone's like oh it's gonna be you know it's a strike while they're on top like it really dawned on me that footage is not fucking forever you know that that when when you're uh doing the, when you're actually in the game the footage has an expiry date you know like the footage comes out and then it just spoils, you know, like once right. it's out, once it's, it's rotten. And then like, now what are you, that's gone. Like, now what are you going to do? You know? And then, and, and life turns into this, uh, this really fucking frantic, desperate, pathetic, like, you know, chasing the spotlight around to try to always have like, and, and, and the, like, like, what, what like, where, what's next? You know, like, what do you got next? It's just this scary, daunting question. Like, fuck you, you have to have something next or you're, you know, you're only as good as what you're doing right fucking now. And I hate that. And, uh, I've, I've always yeah. hated that when people are like, well, so what are you up to? Um, I'm right here with you right now. That's what I'm up to. Right. Let's, what, what, what yeah. is this? Oh, I got this. And and then you feel worse when you start talking to people and go, oh, well, I'm doing this and I'm writing this and I'm doing, shut the fuck up. I do, you know, I don't need to sit here and talk about it. It just, you feel stupid because you almost feel like you're defending not doing anything. <laughs> right. For right. Sure. And I found it scary. I found it frustrating. And the idea of being in the limelight, you know, being in the spotlight is uh, it's inherently fucking dark and, and depressing because, you know, it's, it's a temporary situation, you know, and to try to keep that going, is like, it's like a lot of pressure and it's a, a lot, but, um, whether I liked it or not, whether I, you know, whether it was fucked up, there's nothing healthy about a, a life as an, you know, an entertainer. In you know, show business, there's nothing fucking healthy about fame or celebrity. But at the same time, nobody's trading it in. And, um, you know, from when I from when I got out to California, I just felt like, oh, fuck you. Fuck everybody. Like, you want to you tell me to strike when the iron's hot fuck you like i'll make the fucking iron hot dude and fucking <laughs> you can strike you fucking assholes you know like i'll fucking you know and it just it motivated me and, and um from that from the very beginning and even when i was like wildly out of control on drugs like i just like i just hit the hustle button you know like i i uh I, I know that when 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 Jackass first got ordered, like I said, I had all this video footage, all this shit that I sent into real TV and stuff. And when Jeff Tremaine first told me that the pilot got ordered to series, he said, the first thing you do is uh, pack up all the video footage you got. I know you got a lot and send it to us so we can license it and just put some of it straight onto the show. And I was like, fucking right on. And um, when I sent it in, he told me, uh, I was like, I called back and I'm like, dude, so what are you guys going to use? And he was like, sadly, not one clip you sent us, uh, is allowed on TV. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, uh, I mean, to be fair, in some cases it was just shitty fucking dubbed back and forth. The quality was low. In some cases it was just filmed bad, but for the most part, my thing was like, my specialty was jumping off roofs, you know? And uh, my my motto was that whatever you're doing, it's cooler if you're on fire. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and and uh, two of the rules that we had, like they kind of, you know, we had uh, rules that we had to kind of uh, follow. And that was that if we were going to jump off of something off of Jackass, it couldn't be over a certain height because uh, they were really worried about little kids copying it. And MTV had like all kinds of problems with fire where like uh they they had one lawsuit where um 
like that kid in the trailer park where like burned down the trailer, killed his sister. And they were like, why did you do that? And he says, beef has been fire, fire, you know, like, mm-hmm. and, and then MTV was found liable. So, and then they had another fire and then another lawsuit with Vince. So fire, MTV just didn't fuck with fire. You know? and I was <laughs> and like, here you are, fire guy. Yeah, I'm the fire guy. I'm 100% the fire guy, man. And like, if I'm not jumping, if I if I'm not jumping off something so that's way too high for MTV, I'm probably doing that. I'm probably on fire while I'm doing that. And if it's not either of those things, then it's something like even more fucked up, you know? Because like yeah. I was, uh, I, I I I had a, a real knack for dark shit. And um, and the point being, I tell that because uh, out of the gate, the the first impression I had the show, and I think this was before it even was called Jackass when they had ordered it. I think it was like working titles, you know. Um, I thought, fuck, man, like this is kind of like weird. Like it's gonna be cool if we get a TV show, but how how watered down is it gonna be? You know, like what kind of a fucking pussy ass show is this gonna be? I thought, but oh well, you know, they they're telling me that I can make uh, too hot for TV videos because in that time uh, during that whole era you know late night tv was littered with girls gone wild you know like kind of these like not a lot on tv videos and if you call right now right. we'll throw in a bonus video <laughs> right. so I, I knew that i was going to be making too hot for tv dvds and, and i got to work with that like really pretty quickly and um you know it was, it was like i teamed up with some people who didn't think it was important to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like but you've I done that this, a lot. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, let me oh, ask yeah. you. Yeah, do you, do you feel like now after you know you got control of the drinking, you've been sober what ten years? Twelve years. Twelve years. Uh, and you're engaged. You still engaged, or I am. I'm still engaged. All right. I'm so still... look. So you survived somehow. You did all these things, and here you are. We're uh, we're in our forties. You're probably in your forties, right? Forty-six. All right. You're you're younger than I am. But now you're sitting in your trailer and you're doing tattoos and you're going on the road and you got this YouTube channel. Are you able, like a few minutes ago, you were talking about you just want to be in the moment and like they're saying, you got to do this, you got to do this. And it kind of fucks up that moment when you start to feel like things, all all the stress builds up and all you have to do. Do you feel now sitting here, do you feel like you're enjoying the moment now? Do you feel like you're getting a grasp on who Uh, you are? It's it's such a gnarly question, you know, and and I I, I would, uh, you know, Compare that question to to the, it's. I, I feel I find it so uncomfortable if somebody says, uh, or I used to find it uncomfortable to be asked, "Are you happy?" I, yeah, I didn't say that happy. Seems <laughs> so like such a simple question. Are you happy? And and over the years, I feel like that being asked if I'm happy made me terribly uncomfortable because. My honest answer, my gut instinctual, my instinctual answer is no, I'm not fucking happy. Yeah. You know? And and, and uh I just know that I'm not fucking happy. I know that I don't enjoy the moment. And yeah, I do enjoy some moments, but overall, I have this like this uh overwhelming sense of impending doom, you know, and maybe it's uh that same impending doom about oh you strike while the iron's hot you're going to be a hazard maybe that's just like fucking scarred onto my brain but when i think about it and i finally come to terms with that question and i've come to terms with my honest answer being no i'm not happy and i've come to terms with that because i finally decided you know what the fuck does being happy get you you know what does being happy like oh i'm happy i'm content okay so i'm just gonna chill you know, like, no, like, I think that that uh, I have a sense of impending doom, some feeling that everything is not fucking okay, that it's not going to be fucking okay, and that I better frantically hustle to try to work to make things okay. And as such, I'm not comfortable, I'm not happy, but that's where my hustle comes from, you know? And, and, and I, like, rather than be lazy and content i would rather be super uncomfortable and fucking hustling like a maniac to get shit done you know yeah so I mean, like it's a point of pride for me that i'm not happy that i'm not content um that i can't enjoy the moment because it's just fucking oh, i've got to, i've got to make shit happen i gotta and 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 so then i i feel like there's another component to the question is that you know beyond 
like, am I enjoying the moment? Am I able to, to be happy? But like, have I gotten, you know, having done like bad, like pretty bad business over the years, I was never motivated by money. I'm just an attention whore. You know, I didn't do very well business wise. Every attempt at investing money has just completely gone sideways on me. And, uh, you know, but, but at this point where I'm at now, you know, and, and as a result of being sober, able to focus myself and not waste time making bad decisions, but really just kind of apply myself uh, deliberately in, in productive ways. Like I, I'm finally kind of getting better at the business side of things, you know, um, like uh, I, I've put together like with, with uh, my attention whoring, I've been able to put together a, a substantial following on social media. And, you know, I really care. I, I care so much about the quality of the content that I put out. And I think that that, uh, like has built a, a level of goodwill with my audience. You know, they know that if I post something that like they can click play and that, that it's generally, they can count on it being a good video, that kind of thing. And, and with that following, it doesn't mean that, that you're doing well, you know, like to have a, a big social media following it is like sort of like, you know, having a storefront with lots of traffic coming through, but that doesn't really accomplish much if there's nothing on the shelves that you have for sale, you know, like, it's it's like the, the social media is an engine, and you need that it that the that if that engine's not attached to anything, then then nothing's really happening. Inside of you is brought to you by Geico. You gotta love Geico, man. Geico, Geico Easy, Geico Bundling, all in one. I mean, you're talking about a guy who just can't doesn't get his crap together. Geico helps me get my crap together. I don't have to deal with other insurance policies an auto policy, a homeowner's policy. I just do it all with Geico. It's Geico easy. I I have a home. I have monthly bills and I have auto. And Ryan, you live in an apartment mm, and, you, and you have auto bills. Do I got a lot of bills. Is that what you call them? Auto bills? Auto bills? Car bills? Car bills? Car, car bills? bills? Car bills? You have car bills? Yeah. And you have... Uh, car bills? You, I have... Um, <laughs> rent? Guest bills? And, uh, I mean, the last thing you want to do with all the editing you have to do, Ryan, is pay checks to different people. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want to just do it? It's a bundling policy. It's a Geico easy. The Geico makes it easy to bundle all these things. Bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing. It's easy. And you already have so much to do around your home. We all have too much to do. Just go to Geico, folks. Go to Geico.com. You get a quote. You see how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Even a Rosenbaum can do it. I see a lot of parallels with you and I. It's weird. It's just like, you know, because that's the same feeling. Like, I always felt really bad if somebody asked me that fucking question. And I, and I didn't say, are you happy? I just felt like, are you in a better place? And I think what right. I, you know, people would say, are you happy? And I go, and I felt fucking horrible that I couldn't immediately just say yes, because in, <laughs> innately right. it was no. Right. And I was like, but yeah. you're, but look around you and I'm grateful and all these things. Right. And I'm like, what's fucking wrong with you with therapy and this and that? Like what, why can't you be, uh, you know, but then, you know, what makes me happy? And I think maybe you could, maybe you could accept this is that the fact that we're talking about it, the fact that we've worked on ourselves the fact that we've come from a certain place and that we're trying to 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 be better and better as whatever as a person i feel like you're doing that to be better as a person to be better as a human being to be better as a a, a friend to be but whatever it is those things and it sounds so corny but if you look at yourself kind of out of control on drugs and lighting yourself on fire and doing all this shit and now you're petting a dog and you're you know you're doing these videos and you're sober and you're doing maybe you could at least in retrospect go well, I'm happier. I'm actually oh, aware, yeah. aware, aware, aware sure. of what I'm, what sure. I am. Sure, and I, I don't want to create the impression that like I'm miserable and that, that I hate my life. It's <laughs> no. not that. It's it's not that, and, I, and I'm profoundly grateful for, for 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 the progress that I've made. Like intellectually, I can absolutely grasp, like uh, you know how. Uh, how pleased I am with the way things are going, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a philosophy of Buddhism that all suffering 
comes from craving and that and and that whether things are good or bad, say, they, 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 this is like a Buddhist thing that I kind of really latched on to. Um, if, uh, if, if we're in pain, we crave for that pain to end. It's just common sense, you know? But if we're having some pleasurable sensation, we, we every bit as much crave, we crave for that pleasurable sensation to intensify, to last longer, you know? Like, no matter what fucking situation we're in as human beings, we crave for, you know, more good. And, like, I don't know, and so that's why people who have millions and millions of dollars they crave more, you know, like there's just no fucking situation you can put the human being in, you know, where it's enough and you don't crave something or something more. And, and that's why, like the philosophy of Buddhism is that, uh, you know, is that your happiness, you, you just have to be happy on with what is not with how you want it to be. You know, right, like that's right. really, like being in the present, like accepting this how shit is. And, and I, I don't even try that. <laughs> I, don't even try I was, that. I was I just, telling my buddy, I was saying yesterday to my friend Tom, I was like, I just am always anxious. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I go, but I'm anxious about everything. He's like, like yeah, what? I go, like for everything. Like, I got to go down and get the mail. I'm anxious. I got to go take a shit now. I wanted to do something, but I have to shit. I'm anxious. Uh, yeah, 100%. Do you take any medication? Yeah, uh, I, I'm trying something right now that kind of helps with anxiety that, uh, you know, in the, in the beginning stages. So I, I haven't really felt any effect. Are you on something? Yeah, dude, I got a psychiatrist and uh, I take Zoloft. And, and I absolutely, it does, it's not anything that gives you a buzz. Like, like it's never in any circumstance has been considered a substance of abuse. I just find that if, uh, if, if I'm not taking Zoloft, like a, a, a relatively minor disturbance, something that bothers me, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. something that bothers me a little bit can very easily send me to suicidal ideation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, and, right, right. Uh, you know, I've never been like proactive on any level, you know, about killing myself. But what I have done, uh, you know, and particularly when not taking Zoloft is just squander a lot of valuable time with like some crazy, like fantasies about how, like, you know, like, about how like, I could make it so nobody would ever discover the body and that it would be this mystery of what happened to him. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like all this crazy, this crazy, dark, fucking, just perverse, shitty fucking time wasted. And, and I don't deal with that for the most part when, you, uh, when I'm on taking my Zola. Do you deal with pain from all the stunts and all the bullshit you've done? And what do you do for pain? Not, uh, I, since I got sober 12 years ago, I've not even filled out a prescription for painkillers. Like, um, you know, it, like my rule is that if, when I'm in the hospital, um, you know, if they got to knock me out for a procedure, then fucking general anesthesia, that's just part of the deal, you know, and that's them doing it to me. Right, right, and right. And if while I'm, if, if while I'm in the hospital, they're going to put something into my IV, like that's, that's fine. But my rule is that once I'm out of the hospital, nothing like I do, I don't fucking fill out a prescription because because that's where it gets slippery. Right, I'm right. in possession of it, and I'm well, I'll take it as prescribed. Like that's just a slippery slope. That do you still do out. stunts? Do you still do that shit? Or are you? Oh yeah, for sure. Like yeah, you're exactly. comfortable with that. You're like you're still. Are you are you pretty fearless? Would you say? God no, I'm gripped by fear. I'm gripped by fear. I feel pain, and. uh and and those are, I think, two very crucial ingredients to um, the success of, uh, of you know, the projects that I've been a part of. Because if I was fearless, there'd be no trepidation. There'd be, it'd just be like, oh, you know. Right, right, right. And, and, and that's the, the, the fear is kind of what what makes it engaging, you know. And yeah. the pain is what, what like. To not feel pain, would there be no reaction? She, all right. Hey, listen. Uh, hey, this is called shit talking with Steve-O. These are from my patrons. They're just asking you rapid, rapid questions. Here it is. Brett G, can you share a paranormal experience that's scared the crap out of you? Um, <laughs> very little about uh, my paranormal experiences were scary. Some of them were, but um, yeah, I, I had. Uh, 
like insane hallucinations, hearing voices, like all kinds of uh, people walking around who weren't physically there um, while I was on drugs. And uh, rather than, than regale it, I would point you to Steve-O ghost stories. Like uh, that's what we called it. I, I t- told it on the um, the H three H three podcast, and I, I don't think I can do a better job of uh, of recounting it. So, all right, search, yep. On YouTube, search Steve O ghost stories. Christopher M. If time travel was possible, would you want to go into the future, or would you like to visit the past? Well, anybody would want to go to the past. I think to uh, improve their situation now, right? Like Back to the Future too. <laughs> right? hey steve-o uh, don't jump off that cliff asshole uh if you can go back though like honestly is there anything you would change that one thing you always remember like fuck are there plenty of things that you would change i would certainly like to have uh gotten sober at least two two years sooner if I if I could if I could uh, why two go back years because um I, I wouldn't want to, I'd want to be very careful with the space time continuum <laughs> up until that point and uh <laughs> and, and 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 the uh, I I just really mismanaged opportunities and uh, I got like um the last two years of my drinking and using were really fucking uh, destructive humiliating and. Um, counter counterproductive um so i mean i i I suppose i needed all of that humiliation and destruction in order to like be properly motivated so i probably wouldn't want to mess with that either dave p is there a specific stunt that you performed for jackass that you uh, look back and regret for jackass it's all the, the regrets are all about um not digging deeper you know there were just certain things that i I didn't go for and and so the footage didn't make it anywhere you know like um there's nothing i regret doing it's uh, you know we regret what we haven't done better to regret what you have done than what you haven't done and and that's true in my case i like it maddie asks what stunt did you end up not doing but wish you would have that's the there's so many of them (laughs) (laughs) all right Uh, the, the the one that comes to mind is uh trying to unicycle over a, a balance beam over hot coals in India. Um, I just couldn't fucking commit to it, man. And, and, and it was such a magnificent uh, set and, and I just fucking, they set it up for nothing. Were they pissed? No, they, I mean, it's not like that. Like um, it's, I was pissed. Like nobody could possibly have been more disappointed in me than I was. And then uh, on the subsequent movie, we did the fire gauntlet as a redemption, and it just wasn't nearly as cool. Were you ever fucked up on a lot of stunts? Um, yeah, on uh, on my own time for the my Too Hot for TV DVD series, that was um, oh, and that all those are fucking streaming at stevo.com too. Um, if you go to the bottom, Stevo TV, the uh, dude. <laughs> But it was a much darker operation when, uh, you know, I was shooting on my own time. Like, then it was like, you know, like, if we were too fucked up filming for Jackass, then it, it, it would be a little bit like the end of Boogie Nights, where, where he's like, I'm at cock card, I'm ready to fuck, and, and he's all tweaked out on meth. And uh, Burt Reynolds says, "Like, look, man, I can't have on. I can't have you on camera like this. You're a fucking mess, you know? Like, right? There's a little bit like Jackass is a little bit more like like that. That makes our director Jeff Tremaine a bit like that. Burt Reynolds, you know? Like, right? It's not. A, it's not the spirit of Jack. In Jackass, you see us like uh, you know over the years, like hungover, even acknowledging being hungover. There was not that like active. I'm wasted on camera because that was never the spirit of it." It was Le- very much the spirit of what I did on my own time, though. Right. Leanne P., what's your biggest fear? Um, I mean, it's like, uh, I think, uh, you know, fear, I've heard, this, I've heard fear defined as, uh, you know, being it, either not getting what you want or losing what you have is the basis of, uh, of, of, of all fear, I think. And, um, you know, like not getting what you want. I want to be loved. I want to be important, you know, like the idea of not getting that, you know, or like losing everything, like 
of course, I'm, you know, like I've worked so hard to save what I have. Like I'm afraid of losing it. So I think fear is pretty basic in that sense. Alyssa C. Final question. What is the one thing you couldn't imagine living without besides Wendy? Oh my God. If fucking anything happened to Wendy, I would. <laughs> and she comes from the streets. So I, I give her like so much freedom. I just let her roam around. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now. And uh, it's, it's just it's panic inducing when I'm walking around looking for her and I can't find her. But yeah. at the same time, I have to give her freedom. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, but if it's something I can't live without, uh, I would uh, kind of just say my, say my team, you know, I've got, uh, um, you know, my guy, Scott Randolph is like my, my right hand and everything that I do with, uh, you know, production and, and merchandising. And then I've got my other guy, uh, Paul, Paul Brisky, who's, who's my editor. And, um, I'd be fucked without both those guys. Those guys are my secret weapons. That's awesome. And then I have another, I have another secret weapon. Who's a guy named Guy Hickey who lives in Australia. And, uh, I mean, this kid Guy Hickey is just badass. Like I met him as a, as a fan, like probably, probably 15 years ago, maybe. I don't know. Um, and then this kid can just, he can just, it, it's just, whatever it is, like if it's, if it's finding something that's really hard to find, like he'll find it, you know? Right. There's, there's just a lot. So yeah, I, I can't live without the people who, um, who uh, I work with. You know, the last thing I want to say is I just keep seeing you not getting into Cir- Barnum and Bailey circus school. And I just, <laughs> yeah. I, I want to know how devastated at that time in your life you were. I did get into circus school and specifically it was called uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Billy Clown College. Right. And, uh, and 33 clowns got it, got accepted. All 33 clowns graduated, but uh, the idea was only 10 of them, 10 of the clowns got contracts with the the Ringling Circus. And I was not one of those 10. Do you think you were worthy? Uh, You should have been selected. I mean, I, I, like stuck out like as soon as I showed up it was like well this guy I mean I, the reason I went to clown college was because I wanted to become a, a crazy famous stunt man and um I, I just wasn't getting anywhere on my own you know it was my home video camera like just nobody cared and and I just found when I found out about clown college I thought oh Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey like it's this uh reputable you know the, the, it's not even this. It's just like a no name. And and that if I was, if I could graduate from clown college, then I would be a circus professional. People would take me more seriously as a stuntman. So it was more of just a, a means to an end. Right. And my, my, I, like it was evident when I got to clown college that I had no aspirations of being a clown. You know, my, uh, I, I just want, I was just using this as a way to, to further my goal of becoming a stuntman. So out of the gate that there was that. And then there was like, I was fucking drunk every night, you know, like in the first week they had to take me to the hospital and get my head stapled together for shit that I was doing. Like that had nothing to do with fucking clowning. Like, uh, so yeah, I kind of disqualified myself pretty aggressively right away. It just sounds like a movie, a guy who goes to clown school and then doesn't get selected as the clown to go to the circus. It it just sounds like a movie. (laughs) Um, I mean, perhaps, you know, I, I wrote a movie that, that, uh, my buddy's actually trying to, to get made, which is, which is crazy. Um, and, and it's, a, it's a, definitely about a clown. And how bad does it hurt to get your, when you stapled your balls? What'd you do? You stapled? Uh, I mean, there's, um, less nerve endings in your ball sack, you know, like I would never put a staple through my actual ball, but through the skin, it's you know, not as bad. Three, like, like like what I've done, you know, repeatedly for years, like stapling my my ball sack to my leg, and I think that uh, in some cases there's been um, the staple holes in my ball sack like became infected. Like there was there was a couple times where I did that and uh, did another trick where I flipped my balls back and forth and catch them in a mangina. And doing that, like ruptured something one time, like where it was filled with blood, my whole ball sack, it looked like a plum. 
And, uh, but you know, for the most part, it's been pretty minor. Did your girlfriend or your, your, uh, your fiance, does, did she want to look down there and like kind of examine, do you have scars on your balls and things? No. And if she was going to be examining it, she wouldn't be looking for scars. That's for sure. (laughs) 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 Uh, but yeah, no, my, my girl, my girl's pretty fucking down with, uh, like all the, the shit she's okay with this because it's pretty shocking well dude look man this is this has been awesome because i don't really i don't know you i think i might have seen you somewhere years ago but i i feel like it's just so easy to talk to you You're so open i just love that about you and and and, and steve-o people go on the youtube channel you got over five million followers it's so fun to just go to video you find yourself there for like an hour so they just need to go to steve-o.com steve-o.com is the hub where uh where all of my stuff lives um and uh, you know, I like I gotta I gotta plug my book, which um please is, it's uh special because um on Amazon it's got an average rating of five stars. It's a it's you know it's a reliably good book, it's fucking juicier than shit. And every single copy that I sell at Stevo.com is personally autographed. You know, that's I'm actually down here at our warehouse in Carlsbad just signing books right now. Um, awesome. And uh, it's just a fucking juicy ass book. It's meaningful for me to get it out there because, like, uh, you know, my, my story, to the extent that it's inspiring and uplifting and uh, just crazier than shit, um, <laughs> it's, it means a lot for me to get it out there. What's and it so called? I love when I lo- it's called A Professional Idiot, a Memoir. Professional Idiot, a Memoir. Get his book. Yeah. I mean, your story's incredible and it's touching too. I, you can just tell that there's a lot of heart and, you know, you've had a lot of shit go on in your life, a lot of success and all that, but you're, we're all striving to be the best we can and achieve some sort of like oh, being okay with ourselves. Just being like, all right, sure. I'm a fuck up. This is who I am, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> fuck yeah. it. You know what I mean? For sure, man. So, man, yeah, no it, doubt. it was a joy talking to you, man. Anytime you want to come on, man, you're, you're a pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it, dude. I um, yeah, I, w- I was looking forward to this. Uh, it was well worth my time, and uh, and thank you to you as well as everybody else who listens. I also love to do this when when I'm on a podcast that I think was uh, a good experience. Um, it's 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 speaking directly to the people who are still listening because as podcasters, we you know we've got a drop off rate, you know, and then and those who stick around to the very end of the podcast who represent that fucking full retention rate, like they really are the stars, you know, they're they're, they're what we do it all. Yeah. So speaking to those people who are still listening this deep into the podcast, an extra thank you from me. And um and if you really did enjoy it or anything, like shoot me a tweet because when I say hey, I, you know, I listened all the way. To, if I see tweets, I listened all the way to the end on this podcast. Fucking thank you. Like those tweets mean like more than anything. So uh, me too. shoot me a tweet if you're still listening. And, and uh, thanks to everybody involved. You're a good dude, man. It was a pleasure talking to you. Hey, likewise, man. Thank you. I like, I like him. There's something just kind of, I don't give a F about him, but I do. Mm-hmm. Not me, but like himself. Like he doesn't like. He almost has it. I don't care, but I do care attitude, doesn't he? Yeah. There's something about that that's kind of sweet. It's like, I, I'm just going to do my own thing and I just don't care. But, but I do care how it affects people. And I am a fuck up. But, uh, you know, good for him. I enjoyed talking to him. I, I think he was like, who the fuck is this guy? And then we started talking. And, and, but I was kind of like, I, I, you know, I know him from Jackass and all that stuff. But I, I really liked him. I thought he was... Uh, a solid guy uh thank you to everyone out there listening thank you uh check out the the sunspin uh new uh music video where you can find it on instagram on uh sunspin band uh or i'm sure we'll post it on twitter and it's youtube and uh you can also go to sunspin.com and get all the merch the sweet cds and t-shirts and hats and lunch boxes um tell us what you think you can go to hello at inside look at this it's right here mm-hmm See, you can go to hello at inside of you podcast.com, right? Huh. But you could leave messages there. Uh, I check them here and there. Uh, you can go to the inside of you online store and get a uh, bunch of small little shit and uh, lunch boxes and shirts and stuff. Uh, that's that. Please write a review if you love the show. Uh, to all my patrons out there, 
here's looking at you. I uh, appreciate all your love and your uh, devotion to the podcast. I got these new shirts for the top tier pot uh, patrons, and mm-hmm. it's like a one year sort of like bomb squad, B A U M, Rosenbaum squad. Got it. Right. Got it. Here's a patron shout out Nancy D, Mary B, Leah S, Trisha F, Sarah V. They're all right here. Look at this. Little Lisa. Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Lauren G, Nico P, Robin S, Jerry W, Robert I, Jason W, Stephen J, Kristen. Okay. You're <laughs> on top of it. Amelia. Oh. Good Lord. Allison L, Jess J, Lucas M, Raj. C. Joshua. D. Emily. F. S. Shit. CJ. P. Samantha. N. M, good close. Jennifer N, Jackie That's P, Stacy L, Carly H, Jen S, Jamal F, Janelle B, Carrie B, Tab of the 272, not to be confused with. Tab of the 273. Ashley Ryan, Kimberly E, Mike E, Marissa N, L Don Supremo, that's Dan, Jack S, good old Slater, Ramira, Beth B, Santiago M, Sarah F, Chad W, Leanne P, Ray A, Maya P, Maisha, Maisha, Maddie S, Kendrick F, Ashley F, Shannon D. Matt W, Belinda N, Kevin V, James R, Chris H, Osborne. Osborne? Osborne. Osborne. Amy C. We got uh, Dave H, Samantha S, Spider Man. Chase. Sheila. G. Ray H, Alyssa C, Tabitha T, Misha N. Well, let's go a new one. So if I ask you, you know, Tom C. N. Tom N. Henry S. Tom N. Henry S. Remember those the next time. Mm-hmm. Liliana A. Michelle K. What up, Michelle? Hannah B. Michael S. I could do Tracy Morgan. Talia. Luke H. John S. I don't. I don't really do him. Andrew. For a second, I did. <laughs> did you see his thing on the Golden Globes? No. Was it bad? No. He. Well, he. Uh, he announced. Uh, I think it was best animated, and he, the winner was Soul. But he read the card as Saul. Go Saul. People dying. <laughs> great you know if i did that i would get just hounded like this guy's an idiot you're an idiot but him he just everybody it, just it, thinks it's funny it was on brand and it's on brand he, Sow. he didn't mean to do it he didn't mean to do it <laughs> no. yeah of course he didn't mean to do it uh talia m mike s luke h john s andrew t claire m liz j laura l chad b rachel e or rochelle i think it's rochelle but it's rachel because there's no e at the end of it so it's rachel i'm right nathan e brandel d Taylor K, Neil A, Marion E, Meg K, Janelle P, Dan P, Jennifer J, Wayne M, Ojeda. When I say Ojeda, you say Ojeda. Lorraine G. Uh, guys, thank you so much for, for being here with us today with Ryan and myself. I really appreciate you, and, and you take the time to listen to the podcast every week. So spread the word email your friends get them to listen write a review do all that shit thank you for allowing me to be in sight each and every one of you from ryan and myself here in the hollywood hills <laughs> lifestyles of the rich and famous it's lifestyles of the rich and Michael famous Rosenbaum's hat. it's lifestyles of the less rich and the not as famous <laughs> that's what it is um and there'll be people who write and go michael don't do that to yourself you're famous <laughs> You're rich. I'm like, well, rich, believe me. I know rich. I know folks that are rich. Rich is when you don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. Wealthy is like old money. Like, yes, would you like to try the rules this evening, mom? Yeah. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wave at the camera. Ryan. Okay, bye. All right, we love you. Oh, great.